So the, the, the subject that we'll be looking at today is, of course, overarchingly, let's go beyond business as usual. Redesigning our land, water, and marine resources, sorry, marine surveying systems to make them fit for purpose for climate action. Of course, um, I'll be presenting specifically today on the, on the more granular theme of coastal erosion in small island states and involuntary resettlement. Now, very importantly, there are three critical pillars to this presentation today. The first is in relation to fit for purpose surveying systems. I think that goes without saying. The second is in relation to climate impact through coastal erosion. And the third is as it pertains to involuntary settlement, which I would like to take the liberty of framing today in the context of internal displacement, but perhaps more broadly in the context of forced displacement, given my substantive remit with UNHCR. Also quite very much related to that is the fact that there are a number of key global agreements and policy frameworks that this presentation is also guided by. The first is in relation to the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, the second is in relation to the Paris Agreement 2030. And the third, the Secretary General's Action Agenda on Internal Displacement. And I'll perhaps like to mention here also the COP, which is also quite relevant to this presentation today as well. Now, climate impact in the context of the, the of Caribbean SIDS, more specifically as it pertains to coastal erosion, um, is manifested um, by way of pronounced sea level rise, increased frequency of extreme weather events via hurricanes, tropical storms, storm surges, etc. And of course, by way of coastal erosion, quite relevant to this presentation today. Now, when we speak of Caribbean SIDS, we're speaking about those countries that stretch from the Bahamas in the north to Trinidad and Tobago in the south. Interestingly, both of which are extremely low-lying countries. In fact, just a few meters above sea level. Now, a common feature among Caribbean SIDS is what is considered to be a, a high coastline to land ratio, meaning that any rise in sea level is likely to have a disproportionate impact on agricultural lands, infrastructure, and populations located along the country's coastline. Now, very importantly, between 2004 and 2019, there was a notable or a marked increase in the intensity of Atlantic hurricanes and tropical storms. In fact, in 2004, when Hurricane Ivan hit Grenada, um, Grenada was basically ravaged by, by Hurricane Ivan. In fact, to the tune of approximately 26 billion US dollars in damage. And then of course, in 2019, um, when Hurricane Dorian hit Bahamas, Bahamas was also ravaged, but there was a market increase in the intensity between 2004, Grenada's experience with Hurricane Ivan, and in 2019 in Bahamas' experience with Hurricane Dorian. In fact, in the context of Hurricane Dorian, 70 persons died and 29, thousand homes were completely destroyed. And why is this information relevant to this presentation? Because these are small island developing states with large coastal zones where 80% of the populations live within the coastal zones. So it goes without saying that the bulk of the impact was really felt within the coastal zone. Now, about a decade ago, I began, I began some research work in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And St. Vincent also happens to be my home country. Um, but this basically was the underpinning element of my doctoral research. And there were two communities that really stood out to me. Very importantly, the intention was never to look at coastal erosion. No, that was not the intention. It was about looking at disaster risk reduction more broadly. But what came to the fore in this presentation was the impact, the effects of 
tropical storms, storm surges, sea level rise in the context of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, two communities in particular. The first being what is called the New Sandy Bay Village. And you can see the image in the upper left-hand corner. And then of course, the, uh, some of the other images are from a community known as Georgetown, the former capital city of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Very importantly, there is a market impact on the, the coastal area within these communities. In some instances, it is noted that, that the coastline has receded by as much as 50 meters in just about two decades. Now, mind you, St. Vincent is a country of a population of just about 110,000 and a land size of 150 square miles. So one would imagine that in a country where 80% of the population lives within the coastal zone, losing 50, 50 meters of your coastline can have a devastating impact. In fact, one of the images there from, from, from New Sandy Bay Village, you have an aerial view of the sorts of the village. You can see how small that village is. Just imagine for a moment losing 50 meters from such an already small area. So what has happened in the context of St. Vincent and the Grenadines is that there has been quite a number of relocation initiatives, but also very much so coastal erosion has just taken land, taken property at will in the context of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. But what has been the impact on, on the local communities and the countries at large? Now, the, the idea of involuntary resettlement, I would rather not look at it from the standpoint of the overall procedures of involuntary settlement, but I would perhaps rather take it from the human rights standpoint, looking at it from the standpoint of internal displacement. Of course, in the context of the Caribbean, the disclaimer here is that involuntary resettlement, whether by way of eminent domain, um, compulsory acquisition, et cetera, is typically not done in an adverse or adversarial way to the extent that, that local communities or individuals are necessarily dispossessed of their properties. But more generally, more broadly, it is understood that if involuntary resettlement is not done in a correct manner, it will ultimately lead to, a, to what is known as internal displacement. So when we speak of internal displacement, we're essentially speaking about persons who are to a large extent forcibly displaced and there is no clarity on, on issues related to tenure security, et cetera. Now, another very important point is that the Caribbean's response to coastal erosion and climate impact more broadly has been manifested via various regional mechanisms. And I think here of one mechanism the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center. And very interestingly, um, just in April 2022, it was announced that a new LIDAR project was commencing to support decision-making as it pertains to disaster risk reduction initiatives, as well as climate change adaptation initiatives. Of course, this initiative is confined to the borrowing member states of the, of of the Caribbean Development Bank, but St. Vincent and the Grenadines also happens to be one of the beneficiary um, countries under this project as well. But this also brings us to the broader question of the overall resourcing of the and redesigning of the redesigning and deployment of surveying systems for climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Of course, in the context of small island developing states, in the context of Caribbean small island developing states, but even further afield, what are the mechanisms that currently exist um, for the financing and resourcing of these initiatives? The first that I would like to point to is with regards to the facility for loss and damage under the UN Framework Convention for Climate Change. The second refers to more traditional mechanisms. Of course, they are within themselves complex commodities and complex financial instruments that have worked with some degree of efficiency and effectiveness. And I, I, I would like to point to, for example, social protection initiatives, contingency financing, catastrophe risk insurance, such as we would have noted in the, the Caribbean catastrophe risk insurance facility, 
um, catastrophe bonds, which can provide um, a certain amount of buffer um, for rapid payouts after disasters. But in the context of forced displacement, there is also the, the, the Internal Displacement Solutions Fund, which is framed in the context of the UN Secretary General's Action Agenda on Internal Displacement. And whereas we're referring here, in the, when we speak to, to um, involuntary resettlement, we're looking at it perhaps from the con in the context of internal displacement. I'd also like to reference here the Global Compact on Refugees. We're not speaking about the cross-border movement of people, but I think it is particularly relevant in mixed situations because initiatives that are meant to benefit refugees the benefits that accrue to refugees in mixed situations will also accrue to, to internally displaced persons as well. And there are a number of opportunities that exist in this regard. So that in a nutshell is, is my presentation today. And I'm really looking forward to any questions or queries that colleagues may have with regards to the, the content presented here. So thank you and over to the floor. Thank you, Clarissa, back to you.